Dave, welcome to the REI Diamond Show. How are you doing today? Hey, Dan, doing awesome. Grateful to be here and connect with you and your listeners. Nice. So we already did a little bit of a geo stamp, but why don't we do it again for the listeners? I'm tuning in now from Chicago and the listeners know I was in Florida for the winter, loving it. And uh, you are in? I am in Florida because you know why, Dan? I got tired. This was part of my strategy. I got tired of winters and state taxes. So, you know, we came down to uh, came down to Florida. We're on the West Coast. And, um, you know, it's been been a fantastic experience so far. Yeah, it seems like the progression of uh, at least the the old real estate investors I looked up to uh, would go to Florida in the wintertime. And it was like kind of the big dream growing up when I was really young, you know, and uh, got to do that for the first time this year. And certainly will hope to do that again uh, next year if all things work out well. So congratulations on making that move yourself. Awesome. Cool. So Dave, maybe you want to give us like the introduction, a little bit about your business model and a little about a, a little bit about the progression, how you kind of got to the business model that you're running today. Yeah, hundred percent, Dan. So, um, look, I, I grew up in a middle class family in Connecticut, uh, probably like a lot of the listeners out there, right? And and I was told that the recipe for success was to go to school, get good grades, you're going to get a job, and you know that that was right what you were striving for, right? So, I followed down that path. Um, I went to GW in DC and actually did the Marine Corps ROTC program and had the opportunity after school to actually actually go and serve my country. And in the Marine Corps had a phenomenal experience and really got to learn some things they just don't teach you anywhere else in the world. Uh, things such as leadership, teamwork, and integrity. Um, after four years in the Marines, I then transitioned into the tech industry, uh, got into the corporate world, um, and I became really frustrated quickly, right? Because I lost that same sense of, you know, mission and purpose uh, that were so resounding to me, you know, when I was in the Marines. And then at the same time, my wife and I actually had an 18 month old. And then on October 24th, 2000, we literally had triplets. Wow. So, so Dan, we quadrupled the size of our family. I mean, if you could just imagine that, I know you have kids, right? So, um, you know, you just think about what that does to you. So the first thing that I did, um, probably the second thing, the first thing I did was <laughs> have a, have a drink, but the second thing I did was, <laughs> you know, go and see my financial advisor, you know, and say like, you know, Hey, how am I going to do this? Right. How am I going to, um, you know, really provide for my family, you know, create this financial security that I really need to, you just move the goalposts like a mile down the field, right? And so it was at that point in time that it really dawned on me that, you know, the top 1% were not building their wealth, uh, as retail and uh, alternative investments, you know, different things. Uh, so I launched down this kind of obsessive path to figure out how the top 1% are building their wealth. I started investing in alternative assets, everything from oil and gas to raw land, uh, to office space, to retail, multifamily, uh, you name it. Um, I also became a business owner. Uh, I created a, a tech uh, consulting company, which I took full cycle and exited. Um, and running a business, learned a lot of things, including taxes and creating a proper tax strategy. And so fast forward 20 years, and I wrote my book called The Holistic Wealth Strategy, uh, which is really an encapsulation of my learnings over the past 20 years to try to really create this comprehensive system of how can you build your wealth outside of Wall Street, you know, and investing directly in Main Street and having this comprehensive system, right, that truly can multiply your wealth as well as protect it. Thank you for your service, Dave. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank it's you. interesting to hear you say the um, frustration when you got to corporate America. And I wonder how many we hear like some of the stories about vets who really can't integrate. And I feel like you nailed it on the head with not having that purpose and mission. And maybe some of that, you know, here, here's what you do today. Here's what the mission is. Go and accomplish it. And you kind of check off the box. And that's not exactly there very well in corporate, let alone, uh, you know, any myriad of other jobs that people could land in. And it seems like at least the people on my team who are uh, military, 
man, the, the purpose, the discipline, the, the stick to itiveness, the ability to just get stuff done without a lot of extra. It, it's really great having military people on the team. And I'm sure you'd agree with that. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think there's another important distinction, right, which is uh, the majority of corporate America still operates on an old paradigm, which is really a time and effort economy, right, which was which was based on the industrial age. Right. We, we went to, you know, people went to work uh, during a certain time. They did an eight hour shift. Right. Because it was all based on, you know, factories and manufacturing and everything. Uh, but in this day and age, we should be driven based on being in a performance based economy. So whether I work two hours in a day or 12 hours in a day, you know, entrepreneurs are rewarded for their performance. What kind of value can they create in the marketplace? And I really wanted to be someone who could, you know, create value and, and have impact. Yeah, that's solid. I love the performance-based economy. I think that's why I always gravitated towards sales positions, like save the salary. I'll take 100% commission, and then I'm responsible for my results, whether good or bad. Um, so, Dave, I feel like that's part of the takeaway that's likely in the holistic wealth strategy. I mean, I don't know. I didn't read the book. It didn't come out yet. Um, but when I hear those three words, the holistic wealth strategy, I think, you know, a lot of us who are probably listening in right now conjure up certain things of what that might mean. And for me, a performance based economy or performance based mindset feels like part of that maybe maybe not are there four or five other chunks or how would you describe or sum up uh the holistic wealth strategy sure dan so we really created five simple phases with which people could go through the journey um and the underpinning to all of that is that it all really starts with you and creating a vision for yourself you know, and sadly, a lot of, you know, people in the country just do not uh, have not provided enough thought into creating that vision and that roadmap for their financial future, for their future with their family and what that looks like. I mean, think about it, right? The only written document we have about the future might be a will, right? That's <laughs> actually written and put together. Uh, but we don't have anything that really talks about our vision. So it's important to get crystal clear on where it is you're heading, you know, just, just like you would do if you go on a road trip in your car, the first thing you're going to do is type in your GPS so coordinates so you know where you're going to go. Um, and, and the reason why this is so important is I found over the years, it's very interesting because, you know, when you kind of peel back the layers on, you know, what does money really mean? right? It, it, it actually means, it, it means there's something, there's some deeper meaning to it. And what I find is that people are primarily driven uh, by creating freedoms in their life, right? They want to have the freedom of money uh, to be able to, you know, create experiences for themselves and their family. They want to have freedom of purpose to be able to do what it is that, you know, really fires you up in the beginning of the day. Um, they want to have freedom of relationship to be able to spend time with who they want to spend time with. Um, so all of these freedoms are really kind of, I think, at the core of what we're trying to get to. Uh, and when you get a deeper understanding of that, it's kind of interesting because some of these things don't actually take, you know, money to accomplish, right? It can be just, you know, changing some of your habits or, or how you're spending your time to achieve it. Okay. So did I miss, I have vision for the future, and then we had a few more? So the vision, you know, the vision is the beginning, Dan, right? And okay. then we walk into phase one uh, is all about mindset, right? Because there are many people that you will talk to about, let's say, investing in real estate, uh, an alternative asset or something like that. And a lot of people will say, you know what, my financial planner tells me it's risky, you know? I've never heard of this before. Why don't I know about it, right? So you get things like that and we all have limiting beliefs. And you know the reason is because there's a $30 trillion financial services industry that has an agenda and wants you to think that that's the only place you can park your money. And oh, by the way, you're not smart enough to manage your money on your own, right? So you have to really have a growth mindset uh, you have to start creating some goals and habits that support your vision um, and really kind of letting go of some of those limiting beliefs. 
Um, and once you can kind of have that growth mindset, you know, that you can then move into the second phase, which is actually, you know, what we call increasing our IQ and in multiple dimensions. So you want to increase your uh, financial IQ so you can understand that there's all these different types of alternative uh, investment vehicles out there that are not marketed to you. Um, you want to constantly be improving your mindset IQ, right? So you can be thinking with an abundance type mindset, not scarcity mindset. Um, and also this is a holistic uh, approach, right? So health is so important, right? You could have all the money in the world, but if you actually didn't have your health, I mean, where is that going to get you? Right. So, so understanding and being proactive with your health is really key. Um, and then relationships, right? You know, you're a product of the five people that you spend the most of your time with. So, are those people leveling you up towards your next goals? Right. Or are they actually detracting you and pulling you down like crabs in a bucket? So, what's the third phase then? So then we move into, uh, you know, once you've kind of gotten smarter, you have the right mindset, um, we move into actually creating an infrastructure around this wealth strategy. So uh, during the course of my years, I actually fired five different CPA firms because I could not get the right advice. And I finally found the right firm. Uh, we, we jointly collaborated and created a proactive tax strategy uh, that talks about what you're doing today, where you're going in the future, and how you can really you know, mitigate, you know, frankly, your number one biggest wealth destroyer out there, which is taxes. So creating that tax infrastructure is absolutely key. Um, we also do something called uh, infinite banking, uh, which is actually cash value whole life insurance insurance policy. Um, this is a very sophisticated way that a lot of uh, ultra high net worth family offices use as the cornerstone to their wealth building. Um, and it's a cash value insurance policy that you can put capital in. Uh, it grows completely tax free. You can give it to your heirs tax free. You can create a tax free income stream uh, from it. But best of all, you actually have access to the capital. So like unlike a 401k plan, you can actually reach into the policy at any time, pay for your kid's college, use it for a down payment on that next deal, or actually fund a deal and use the same dollar twice to amplify your return. So that's a very sophisticated strategy. Um, we also talk about asset protection. Uh, clearly, you want to, you know, the strategy is to, um, to control everything but own nothing, right? So that uh, you know, if creditors were to come after you or something that you're completely uh, protected. So those are some really key elements that we talk about in kind of creating this infrastructure. And then, Dan, we'd move into phase four, uh, which is, uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, new clients might say to us, wow, this sounds really interesting, Dave. I've learned a lot, and um, but I, I just don't have any, you know, capital lying around. Well, we start to look at their existing portfolio and, you know, over 90% Americans have their money in two places. It's trapped up in, uh, you know, equity in their primary residence, so trapped equity that's earning zero. And also it's in 401ks and IRAs, just government sponsored qualified plans um, that's you know, I don't know about you, but I would rather pay taxes on the seed rather than the harvest. So by actually maybe repositioning some of that, you know, 401k capital out today, even though you pay the taxes and the penalties and putting it into more tax efficient, you know, passive income oriented uh, type of opportunities, you can really optimize uh, your results. So we look at really asset repositioning. And then the final phase uh, really moves into building massive passive income. And our investment thesis is this, Dan, we're looking for assets. You know, if you had a thousand bucks in Tesla stock, the only thing you're hoping for is that that stock is going to go up, right? In value. But in actuality, it can go sideways, it can go down. So it's very one-dimensional in nature. But when we look at asset classes like you know real estate, um, we actually even have an oil and gas fund. Um, and these kind of asset classes are very tax efficient. So 
you're creating this predictable passive income and the income can completely be offset. Um, so, so that's another huge advantage in the oil and gas, for instance, you can even offset active income. So you can take W2 income, uh, if you're a high income earner and literally offset a hundred percent of your investment, then realize pa monthly passive income on that. And then we look to, uh, drive forced appreciation into these assets and sell and, you know, three to five years. And there you get an equity kick on the back end as well. So once you've tried to, you know, put all of these things together, you really create a snowball effect. Okay, a lot of interesting stuff here. Uh, I want to pull apart a little bit first. Thread the oil and gas. So I'm not very familiar with that. We do a lot of syndications. It's real estate. There's this cost segregation study done and we get a huge accelerated depreciation in year one and maybe some left over for year two. And then when that asset is sold, there's uh, a recapture and there's a bit of a repayment of sort of that tax benefit. Can you tell me sort of the details play by play on maybe a recent oil and gas investment? Let's just take me putting $100,000 into the investment that maybe you know about right now that I don't. Sure. What is that going to do for me as a high income earner? And what is it going to look like from that tax efficiency standpoint, Dave? Yeah, great question. So uh, just to walk through that example, you would probably receive 75 to 80% in year one of that 100K uh, would go as an active loss on your K1 statement. So you'll get a you'll get a K1 statement in March, you know, probably this this month actually, uh, that would come out and it would uh, classify that as an active loss. So if you're you know you have an income of say 500k, uh, you then reduce that by in this case let's say if it was 80,000, you would now be paying taxes on 420,000 of income instead of 500,000 in income. Right. So that's money in your pocket uh, right away. Um, and then, um, you know, and, all and of these. Stop you. Does yeah. that matter if I'm like I have to be a real estate professional? To no, no. This you know, this is the great thing about this, Dan. Right. Is with oil and gas. And this has really been around since the 80s, since the Reagan era. Right. Where we're trying to the government is incentivizing investors to invest in oil production in this country um, because, you know, most of it is done by small business and it's really supported. You know, our strategic national defense uh, it supports our GDP and our economy. It really drives everything. So that's why they've kind of created these uh, tax benefits. OK. Um, Right. So so uh, continuing on with the progression of how that would work, work, that would be year one. And then they also do classification of your monthly distributions and as far as a return of capital. So therefore, you're not getting taxed on the capital that's being returned. And then once they have the liquidity event, uh, you, you know, the most you would be subject to is long term capital gains at that point. Um, but our uh, plan is to have a subsequent fund that you can actually do a 1031 exchange in. So just like in real estate, you can do that in oil and gas. So we can defer any capital gains as well. So ideally, just, you know, continuing to, um, you know, to transition that. And what type of returns would something like this on average for that $100,000 investment? So in this fund, um, our our fund has been averaging 15 to 20 percent is really the target um, that we have. This is a 200 million dollar fund uh, that's just uh, being put in place as we speak. Um, and then the uh, equity multiple on that is 3.5 X right now in in about a three to five year hold period. OK, so it's three to five year hold. Two hundred million dollars, and we're going to produce a fifteen to twenty percent target. What amount of that fifteen to twenty percent comes in a monthly distribution, and when would that start? So it's anticipated in Q two right now that the first distributions, because they're actually putting in brand new wells, and it takes actually sixty days uh, for hydrocarbons to come out of the ground, and then we get paid for them. Um, so yeah, we anticipate uh, Q two uh, for the first distributions. 
Okay, so there'll be a quarterly distribution, and what are they uh, gonna... actually monthly? So they're they're paid out monthly. There is more volatility to it, so you know you may have a, a month or two where it's uh, it's under, right? Because the the business plan in this case is that we're putting twenty different wells online. So, um, you know, that's kind of a ramped. Uh, progression, right? Once we get that, they call it flush production, which is when all of the, the wells are really optimizing their output. Um, and that's when we can receive, you know, the most amount of uh, capital from them. So in a year one, it might be very small, maybe it would it be realistic. To no, say I mean, la yeah, la last year, no, we were in that target range about 18, 19%. In the first year? Yeah. Wow. So they take the 200 million and just sort of understand that funds business model, 20 wells are going to take about how long to implement. I mean, is that like with real estate, a lot of times the funds that we're dealing with, Dave, and you probably know this, uh, you know, we raised 20 million and then we're buying 16 self storage unit deals, but these are like sporadic. You do like three in one quarter, then none for one or two quarters and then the money's still sitting there, so it's not really producing a return. And then the fourth quarter out from the beginning, maybe you get two or three more deals and it might take a while to deploy the assets. Is the deal flow a lot faster in the oil and gas? Yeah, it's about a it's about a 12 month window they look at to deploy all of the capital. Um, but so they're 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 drilling uh very actively and putting rigs in. And what's interesting as well is, you know, I think the biggest risk to this type of investment is that, you know, we don't know the price of oil and gas, right? So that's kind of you know uh, changes. We can't really control that. Uh, but we also have the opportunity on volume to do really well also. Like some of some of these initial wells that we're putting in right now in Wyoming, um, are looking extremely promising. So you get a nice, you know, unicorn or something that's really big um, that could really literally make it up for it for the entire fund. Wow. And then now 20, will, uh, 20 wells, are a few of them going to be dry when they attempt to drill or are we like technologically pass that as humans right now? Yeah. So that's a great question. And if yeah, people aren't familiar with the asset class, um, this is part of the reason. So we create in this fund, it's actually across five different basins. Okay. So we diversify by being in different areas. And then we also target what's called uh, proven developed producing wells. So yeah, there's 3D seismology, there's all kinds of technology that goes in. And we know for certain that there are hydrocarbons under the ground, right? It's just a matter of how can we, you know, you know, tap into them and then really optimize the flow that we're going to get out of them? So by doing this, it, it significantly reduces our risks. And then, you know, alternatively, if we do start to drill and we realize that there could be, you know, could be a bad hole that we're drilling, uh, we can actually redeploy the assets into another area, right, without losing all of the capital on that. Okay. And then the three to five year exit. So how is there a value add? Who's the buyer? What is the exit? Right? What is what is that final wrap up there of these, this $200 million fund look like? Yeah, sure, Dan. So there's really two different buyers in this, right? You have um, what's basically a, a production, a producer, like a larger one, say ConocoPhillips or something. Um, there's probably around 20 to 30 transactions a month of these producers looking to increase their footprint, increase their production. And so we've done all the work, right? We've gotten the land leases in place. We've done all the drilling. So now they, they can just bolt this onto their production. Uh, so a lot of deals are happening in the market around production. And then the second type of buyer is um, like someone who's looking for income. So let's say pension funds uh, or family offices, and especially right now with the bond markets being upside down, uh, people are really looking for cash flow for their investors. Uh, so these types of assets become very attractive. Uh, and of course, you know, if you look at the broader macroeconomics right now, um, the demand for energy on a global basis is just, you know, ever increasing. Right. And we have such a shortfall in supply. So so it's also a great asset class to be exposed to. 
you know, at this point in time of, of where we are here in early 2023, right, with so many, you know, crazy things going on geopolitically and kind of across the world. Um, but, you know, we try to invest in asset classes that fundamentally, you know, really make a lot of sense. You know, we, we, we know that uh, the, there's very strong demand uh, for hydrocarbons. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you know, even with the the green energy push, it just from the numbers that I've reviewed, it looks very unrealistic to think that we're going to take ourselves off of gasoline and oil. I don't know any time in the next 15, 20 years, maybe a lot longer than that, without a, a significant ramp up in nuclear energy. Yeah, completely. All of the everything that's gone into the green initi energy initiatives um, have barely made a dent uh, into you know the, the the needs for for energy. And also, even if you think about the uh, you know the, the cars like EVs on the road and everything, um, do you know how much it takes petroleum based machines to actually mine? Uh, to create the batteries that they have. And then those cars are driving on asphalt roads and concrete bridges uh, and all this other infrastructure that requires, you know, petroleum-based products. I mean, literally even, you know, uh, women's makeup is developed of petroleum-based products, right? So, wow. you know, just, just look around, you know, your office and in your day and think of how many products, you know, are, are driven from petroleum. And it's, it, it's pretty staggering. That's pretty cool. What are, what other big risks would I want to consider before making an investment in an oil and gas uh, fund like this? Yeah, good question. And, you know, that's really kind of part of our business model as well, Dan, is that, you know, you know, having invested as a passive investor myself for 20 years, um, I really had to you know, develop a kind of comprehensive due diligence and really understand, you know, who you're investing with. Uh, we always try to invest with, you know, the jockey, you know, not the horse, right, is really important. So, um, you know, trying to understand uh, that that team is really critical. And we've, you know, I think we've really helped uh, to do that in this case to, you know, perform our due diligence on this operator. Um, I've invested in uh, this opportunity myself. I know the entire executive team has. So those are some key things uh, that go into, I think, um, you know, something you should always be uh, diligent, right, about before you make an investment. Um, another key thing that I'll put out there that's, that's very unique to this, especially if you got a lot of real estate investors, is... Um, the you will actually sign uh, investors would sign uh, subscription documents as a general partner and not as a limited partner. So the next question is, okay, well, what do you do to mitigate your actual, you know, any exposure to liability from that standpoint? Well, first of all, you know, you have to be a GP in order to uh, obtain the active losses. Uh, is is how that works. And then once all the capital is in the fund is actually converted um, into, you know, producing wells and allocated, uh, everyone in the fund will automatically get converted back to an LP status. So that's kind of, you know, the the, the trigger for when that happens. And then to mitigate uh, any risk as being a GP, they have a very extensive insurance policy that covers anything that could happen environmentally uh, or any accidents or things like that. That's a very significant policy uh, that's been in place. And, um, you know, so far, uh, I think that mitigates any uh, potential liability risks. Do you know of any nightmare scenarios where this general partner type of setup did come back to bite the GPs that were involved in the deal? Not that I'm familiar with. Okay. So let's shift gears here. The other interesting topic I'd love to pull apart a little further would be the infinite banking concept. I've heard about this. Um, let's go with the same example. I have $100,000 in cash. I make $500,000 a year. And the infinite banking strategy is new to me why is it important what does the setup look like maybe all of that hundred somehow is used in it maybe a portion i mean what would be kind of the guidance for that kind of a, an example dave yeah sure dan so um look i came i've been using this with my wife for about 10 years now 
And what I found as part of this kind of wealth strategy that we put together and everything is that anytime you deploy your precious capital, you want to have it do multiple things at the same time. So again, back to our example of, you know, a thousand bucks worth of Tesla stock, like it's only doing one thing for you. Um, when I learned about infinite banking, it's really amazing all of the different things that it actually does for you. So functionally speaking, it's this cash value policy. So you could take that 100K that you're talking about. Um, it, it would be post-tax dollars, though. But you take the 100K, you would fund it into the policy, and then that value is going to completely compound tax-free at about just about a 6% return over the life of it. Uh, and any of you detail oriented ones out there want to do that, uh, actually run that math out over 20 years and you see uninterrupted compounding, um, even on a 6% return, uh, how strong that actually becomes. So you have this tax-free compounding, which is super valuable. Um, again, you create legacy wealth because upon your passing, it goes to your heirs completely tax-free. So that's another huge value point. You can also create, let's say whatever age you wanna at age 65, even at age 50, if you want, you can start pulling money out of this on a monthly basis, create this income stream that's completely tax-free. And the reason why it's tax-free is because you're essentially just taking a loan off of your existing capital. That's what you're doing. So there's no taxable event. So that's a really huge benefit because when we think about, you know, the notion of retirement or later years, all you want is some kind of income stream, right? Well, this does it in a tax-free way and you have control of your capital. So that's really valuable. And then the other thing that I find not enough people have a strong enough strategy to wherever they are in their journey is liquidity. Right. And, you know, I know you know this uh, in private equity and real estate. Right. I mean, the, the, the biggest detractor is that you don't have enough liquidity. So where are your 12 months of reserves capital for, you know, your personal economy? Uh, also, where do you keep dry powder for, let's say, that next deal that's coming up? Uh, what I do is all the income streams I have from all my different passive investments. I actually cycle them right into my policy right away, right? So I'm adding more velocity before I go invest into that next deal that I have, right? So that adds additional velocity. And then the really huge thing about this is it's all about the autonomy and being able to access this capital whenever you want for whatever you want. So it literally takes filling out a one page form, sending it to the insurance company. And within a few days, it's wired into your account. And you can take that, say you wanted to take that capital back out, you take the capital back out, you could invest into another deal and your capital is actually still growing in the policy, right? So this is the beautiful thing is you're actually using the same dollar twice. So you're borrowing it out and then putting it into, let's say, one of your real estate deals that's growing at a certain rate. Uh, and then it's also still growing at the cash value. Now, you still have that debt service component, but there's usually a little bit of a spread in that. So, so that's a, you know, a sophisticated way to, again, add some additional velocity. And like I said, I think you know, what's really key, though, is that uh, having access to that liquidity. Like if I wanted to pay for my kid's college, you know, I could reach into there and do that instead of in a 529 plan, which, you know, I watched, you know, do very poorly over a period of 18 years. So um, is is my payment to the cash policy? So I let's say I put 50,000 in, I borrow the 50,000 out. It's growing at the 6% average compounding rate is my debt service payment on the $50,000 loan also going to be 6% back to the policy? Uh, it, it depends on each policy and, you know, what's that set up. There's, it's usually, there's a little bit of a spread. It's usually underneath that though. So it would be 5%? Something like that. Yeah. So we call it 
I invest in one of these uh, oil and gas funds and we're making, I'm going to go conservative. We're making 10% because the oil isn't sure. as expensive yeah. as it was last year. Yeah. Um, that would mean I would have the 10% coming in. Well, I guess the oil and gas might not actually be a taxable situation or event, but let's say it is a taxable 10%. I think the investors on the podcast would probably relate to us doing like hard money loans. So I borrow the 50,000 from the policy and I lend it to another investor who's going to use the 50,000 at 10% interest to flip a house. Uh, the 10% is coming in, it's taxable income, but then I believe I could write off as an expense the 5% debt service back to my policy. And then I would have basically 5% left that might be like a taxable 5%. So it sort of helps me in, in that tax efficiency moment there too, Dave. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't be able to write off the, you know, 5%, but you can use it. I mean, that's kind of why they they call it, right, this guy who started this Nelson Nash, you know, calls it infinite banking, or people talk about this as be your own bank, right? Because essentially, if you think about it, you're taking over the function of the bank, and, and, and right, and you're getting that interest, and you have so much more control. I mean, I know there's a lot of people who actually use it, even if you're, let's say, even if you're going to go buy a new car, you could take 50k from your policy, go pay for cash for the car, and then make your monthly payments like you were going to, instead of paying the car company, you actually pay into your policy. And when you do the math on that over time, uh, you can see how it you know completely compounds uh, from that standpoint. And there's another thing since you you know you bring up like hard money lending, which is really interesting, uh, and a lot of us are always thinking about is it's if you do get traditional you know lending or something, you're always thinking about collateral, right? You know, uh, so in this case you can actually use the cash value of your life insurance policy as collateral for other loans interesting okay so when i look at it right i add up all of those different things right we talked about like you know tax free compounding we talked about giving it to your heirs tax free there's actually even asset protection because it's considered life insurance so if a creditor comes after you, he's not necessarily going to, you know, be able to pierce the veil and get your life insurance, you know, gotcha. value, right? right? So it's a great place to keep that. So so now you have asset protection. You've got that liquidity that we've talked about. Uh, we've you've got the velocity that you talked about. So it's like, you know, this thing can do like five to ten things at once. And, and really that's kind of uh, what I would call it more of like the process of infinite banking. So, so becoming, you know, your own bank to do all those different types of things. And it really becomes a multiplier. And you mentioned that some of the, I think Rockefellers or, or families of that nature, maybe you didn't mention them, but can you pull on the thread of how these uh, ultra wealthy dynasties use this exact uh, method some way, shape, or form? So, I mean, this might even blow your mind even further. So we were kind of talking about the base level of how to set this up. Um, and like, like I said, I mean, I've been such a fan of doing this that I actually got my license for it. And at Pantheon, we can actually help our investors kind of set these up right now because it's so critical that you actually set it up. Like if you were to call an insurance company and talk to them about this, they wouldn't know what you're talking about, right? So it really has to be structured the right way. The insurance industry is very fragmented. Um, but to your question, there's another variation of you can do that you can do with this that a lot of uh, ultra wealthy, if you have 15, 20 million in net worth, uh, you can do something called premium financing. Whereas since you have such a high net worth, you can actually have the bank uh, set up, you set up a loan with the bank and the bank actually pays your premiums and you are the collateral for the loan. So it's, um, yeah, it's pretty mind blowing that you can actually have the bank fund your premiums and buy a $50 million life insurance policy. Wow. 
if you died in that instance, does the bank get 25 and you get 25 or how's that shake out? Yeah, correct. I mean, there's a lot of variations and everything to the structure, but, but sure. I mean, you would owe the bank just like on any, you know, other note that you might have any remaining balance, but typically the cash value is still a lot higher. And so that would go to your heirs tax free. And the high net worth component there is what gets you past the insurance company's underwriting to issue that yeah, policy. Exa exactly. And, and, you know, they're usually around, you know, 15 to 20 million, uh, you know, depending, you know, depending on the uh, provider that you use. Wow. Interesting stuff. Cool. Um, yeah. One of the things you had mentioned here was like also the first phase we were talking about the vision for the future and some people having a will. And I, I did something with my daughter during COVID, right? She was uh, just about to go off to college and like a lot of people her age was not feeling fantastic about the prospects of the future we shall say um and you know i prayed on it dave and and the solution that we came up with was to do like a weekly growth session together just like i do with the executives on my team and and people at various places on my team take an hour sit down write down the goals come up with the vision for the future and we've been doing that now for like a year and a half two years and we sketch out the goals and she got things to look forward to and she moved to philadelphia and she's working on her criminal justice she got a dog right so it's uh it's not just money that we want to have our goals around but like what does the actual future look like and it, it seemed odd at first it was real weird you know she's uh 17 18 and we're like sitting down to do dad's weird thing <laughs> mm -hmm. um but it's been very rewarding and we don't do it every week like we were uh in the beginning there while she's away at school and she's kind of busy doing her thing but we did sit down and do it on new year's day this year and it was really cool to see a lot of the stuff we checked off the box and we updated the list and you know we created a new one um and i remember having to find that kind of that kind of thing like all on my own as i was building my own business diamond equity investments and trying to get myself out of uh, a not so great situation i had to like you probably like you we're grabbing them from you know this book that book this mentor that mentor and so to have something like that now is sort of uh passing down the vision through to my family to me that's almost like more important inheritance than the money and i'm sure the people who are going to inherit the money wouldn't think the same right <laughs> but maybe it is you got to be able to kind of have this holistic wealth strategy to be able to like pass that down to the other people in your family so that what is passed down maybe isn't squandered right because it's so much more about life uh it, this is so much more than just the money itself, right? And I think a lot of people who have neglected a lot of the other areas of the holistic approach uh, have left people shorthanded, sadly, with not the great life skills to kind of manage the things that they have gotten. And I'm sure we all know of stories and people we've heard of that have kind of, you know, second generation to third generation, there's nothing left by the time the third generation gets there, right? Yeah, hundred percent, Dan. Um, you know, getting clarity on that vision is just so important. Uh, one of the questions I love to ask uh, our clients is, you know, if you had a hundred million dollars, what would you be doing? Where would you be? And who would you be with? Right. And really do some deep thinking on that. So you'd kind of take money out of the equation. And, and again, it really kind of boils down to, you know, trying to live your life with some of these freedoms that we're after. Right. If you had freedom of money, you had freedom of time, purpose and relationship, you know, where could you be? And sadly, I mean, how many times, Dan, have you heard like uh, super inspiring, say, podcast or TED Talk or, or read a book uh, about something where someone actually had a chronic illness, loss of a loved one, or some like major event in their lives that really was the epiphany for them to completely change how they were living their life, right? So, you know, I encourage uh, you know, people that we talk to, and this is kind of the impact that we're trying to make is, you know, get control of your life, you know, get control of your vision, get clarity on what that vision is, uh, because you can be living that today, you know, it, it, it probably takes 
takes a lot less capital than you're even thinking. And there's probably a lot of things that you can rearrange in your life uh, to be able to get there, right? So you can live an awesome life. Nice. Um, Dave, are there any books you'd recommend? I know we had mentioned Nelson Nash, I believe, The Infinite Banking Strategy. Is there one or two others that might uh, bring some more clarity to some of the stuff we talked about that you recommend? Uh, sure. Well, sure. Definitely. Um, you know, if people want to learn more about the holistic wealth strategy, uh, it's uh, actually coming out on Amazon. So you can just get that on Amazon. Or if you want to go to our website, it's pantheoninvest.com forward slash wealth hyphen strategy. Um, and you can download uh, a free version of the ebook and we have some additional resources there as well. Nice. What would be the crown jewel of wisdom that you would share yourself the day that you um, left the military? What would you go back and tell yourself knowing everything that you know today? You are your greatest asset. So investing in yourself will always yield the greatest ROI. So treat yourself that way and think of yourself that way. Solid. Um, Dave, as my final question here, what is the kindest thing that anyone has ever done for you? You know, that's an interesting question, Dan. I'm kind of pondering that. Um, and and my approach is actually there. There's a great book uh, I was just reading uh, by my friend uh, Joe Polish. Uh, it's called What's in It for Them, and it's all about approaching other people and kind of thinking about it from the perspective of you know how can I help this person, right? And stop thinking about things for what am I going to gain out of it, you know? So I'm really always trying to approach people with how can I help them right? You know, whether they have certain pain or they have problems that they're trying to solve, how can I be valuable and useful to them? Um, so th I think that's, you know, one of the approaches, you know, that I try to do. Um, and then, you know, most recently, I think for me, um, you know, I've just had a lot of people doing some awesome things in terms of uh, promoting our book and helping us uh, with the book launch. Uh, and we also have a mastermind and virtual family office for people who are looking to really take their wealth to the next level and just, you know, genuinely, um, you know, our our current client base has just been phenomenal. I've done some really kind things to, to support us with that, so. Nice, cool, good stuff. Well, Dave, I got a couple pages of notes here, a lot of interesting topics. I'm sure we didn't even scratch the surface of what's going to be out there in the book. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to getting my own copy. Did you say that that can be pre-ordered right now? Or yes. Is that... Yeah, it is. You can pre-order it on Amazon. Yep. Okay, cool. Good stuff. So uh, are there anywhere else you would like to point people if they'd like to get some more information about you? I know you'd mentioned the site. Yeah, no, that's it. The uh, I guess the last thing we also have a podcast if you want to check out too, uh, called Wealth Strategy Secrets of the Ultra Wealthy. I will check that out. Awesome. All right, Dave. Hey, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show here. I had a blast and thank you for coming. You bet. Grateful for the opportunity.